Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasant responsibility to issue you a very warm welcome, which I gladly do, and I suspect also to serve as a fall guy for the uh, public address system. Um, can you all hear what I'm saying in the, in, in the back there? Good. Well, as I say, I'm delighted to welcome you here. I'm not entirely certain in what capacity I do so. On a formal level, I'm, uh, I suppose, um, in loco directoris. Our director, Professor Griffiths, couldn't be here, or he certainly would have been welcoming you himself in the name of the Institute for Advanced Study. As executive officer of the School of Historical Studies, I can welcome you in the name of my colleagues, including Irving Levin, in the School of Historical Studies. Less formally, I'm an old friend and colleague of both Irving here in Princeton and of Hank Millen in Washington from my days at Dumbarton Oaks. I'm also, which perhaps not everybody knows, not only the son of an art historian, but at one time wanted to be an art historian myself, so I feel some connection with those aspects of the conference, though not all. I'm not a would-be mathematician, I can tell you that. Also, I'm a distant kinsman of the painter John Constable, who indeed was a celebrated man for the sketch and did, I think, some of his best work in sketches. Now, whatever the capacity, I want to just say a few words, very few, about this symposium, which is unusual and remarkable in the fact that it brings together two centers in two different towns, but with parallel interests in many respects. They're both of them centers of advanced studies in one way or another. And one of the disadvantages of advanced studies, it seems to me, is that sometimes they're so advanced that the practitioners leave not only laymen, but even their colleagues behind. And that makes it all the more important for at meetings like this to bring together people from different fields and this symposium combines people from very different academic disciplines to bring them together around a subject that affects all fields. Creativity, perhaps more than anything else, cuts across specialties. Thank God there are no university departments of creativity, but we're all in departments where creativity is absolutely central to what we and others do. And therefore, I myself was sorry I couldn't be in Washington. I hear it was a wonderful introduction yesterday, but I look forward very much to the speakers today and tomorrow. And now to give you a more formal introduction, I present my colleague, Irving Levin. <coughs> I think it's a peculiar insight into the character of Giles Constable that I've known him now, what, 25 years, and I never knew about this art historical failure on your part. What happened? <laughs> it's been a pleasure to have him as a colleague and also because he has such an, I should say, art historian's sensibility. I have about um, 500 words of introduction, but um, I'm gonna break the what the principle that we started off with and, and reiterate, what an absolutely spectacular time we had yesterday in Washington. The papers were amongst the most creative papers I think I've ever heard, and the event went off uh, absolutely like a work of art worthy of the National Gallery of Art. So I can't at this point avoid acknowledging and thanking my, my comrade in arms colleague in crime, Hank Millen, and the two people who worked hardest, I think, on this event in Washington, Teresa Malley, who is uh, the Associate Director of the Center for Advanced Studies there, and Kim Rodefer, who is assistant in the, for the program of uh, special meetings and publications, which we are, I hope, certainly. Uh, this afternoon, uh, we'll proceed uh, simply uh, with the papers that um, are to be presented, which are unusual in that they're all museological in one sense or another. Uh, each of the papers is supposed to last uh, 30 minutes, uh, after which 10 minutes will be devoted to discussion and questions. 
uh, which I can see there are a lot of people here uh, are very knowledgeable and I hope very much that you'll help us make this the kind of event we had in Washington by, by posing these questions. After the session is over from five to six, there will be a, recess, a reception for you all in the common room of Fuld Hall. Uh, follow the leader and you'll find it. It's across the campus to the main building over on the, over on the right. It's, it's very near and uh, easy to locate. Uh, can I have the first two slides, please? This event marks the golden anniversary of my obsession, love affair would be a more accurate term, with the work of Gian Lorenzo Bernini, the great master of the Roman Baroque, who lived from 1598 to 1680. The affair began when I was a graduate student in search of a dissertation subject at Harvard in the early 1950s. Partly because travel was expensive and difficult. Partly because in those days, art history as a discipline was much more attached to objects than it is today. And certainly also partly by inclination. I wanted to work on something near at hand and something that I could literally get my hands on. In those days, also, museums were somewhat less fastidious than they are today about touching objects. It happened that one of the great riches of Harvard's Fog Art Museum was its collection of some 27 bozzetti, or small terracotta sketches. They range from 12 to 15 inches in height, comprising by far the largest group of autograph studies by Bernini in the world, with no more than a very few in any other collection. It was love at first sight. From my first assignation with them, I felt a certain communion with the artist who, it was said, worked with such passion and concentration that when interrupted, he complained and exclaimed, Pygmalion-like, sono innamorato. The fleeting clay sketches seemed to me the very incarnation of that supreme act of divine love described in Genesis, when God creates Adam from dust. They seem to me to make that same magic leap from inert, formless earth to heaven itself at the touch of a finger. The next on the right. In the end, my dissertation, interrupted by a call to military service, remained a fragment of my intention. But by then, I was hopelessly, endlessly in love. And after half a century, I am still in love, especially with the angels made for the literally graceful, superhuman angels, alighted on the balustrades of the Ponte Sant'Angelo in Rome, ethereal presentiments of unexampled grandeur and monumentality. Perhaps as a way of making love to these little wraiths, the history of sketching became one of the light motifs of my scholarly life. I soon learned, much to my surprise, that sketching does have a history, a profound procedural evolution in which Bernini's models played a role no less heroic than in the visual history of art. And it became one of my dreams to explore this much neglected subject in other forms of creativity, just for the love of it. Although there was absolutely no collusion, it happened that the interests of dear friend and esteemed colleague Henry Millen, founding and now emeritus dean of the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art, had followed an astonishingly parallel and synchronous trajectory in the history of architecture. His work culminated in, the, in two of the most important exhibitions ever mounted in that field, the vast and wondrous surveys of European architectural models from the Renaissance through the Baroque, which many of you will have seen in Washington or one of the many other venues. 
It occurred to us, finally, to get our acts together. And the present symposium is the result. I remember a few years ago reading some of the current literature on, the subject, on this subject in music and finding to my art historical consternation that there was a rather steamy debate going on over the utility of studying musical sketches at all, since the only thing that really matters in the end is the final work itself. Well, maybe so, but I guess there is no accounting for affairs of the heart. I hope and trust the speakers this afternoon will agree, and nothing could give me greater pleasure than to turn this podium over to Ed Cohn, Emeritus Professor of Music at Princeton, a great personal friend and a great friend of the Institute, who has very kindly agreed to lead the session. Ed, have fun. Thank <laughs> you.